You're listening to the Seasteading Today podcast, where we speak to entrepreneurs and researchers who are making the dream of seasteading a reality. The Seasteading Today podcast. Stop arguing and start seasteading. Hello, Seasteaders. On this episode of the Seasteading Today podcast, I'm talking with Tony Olson, the founder of a group that seeks to establish Freedom Haven an open design, freedom-based seasteading micronation outside any existing exclusive economic zone. Welcome, Tony. Thank you for having me. So to start out, let's uh, tell us a bit about uh, your background and how you got interested in seasteading and how you got the idea for Freedom Haven. Um, well, uh, long story, um, as Ron Paul libertarian, I dreamt of a world where those who believed in the importance of freedom like myself could live their ide- ideology. But the vast majority of people do not, in fact, want to, the degree of freedom that people like me seek. Um, since f- such freedom lovers are in a minority, I realized that we would never achieve that dream in, uh, in the majority wins democracy that we currently live in. Uh, there is the Free St- State Project, which you know of, uh, that attempted to solve this by having 20,000 libertarians move from the country to New Hampshire. Um, so that they could get enough votes to actually have more of a libertarian society. Um, but that didn't really pan out. About two years ago, um, I was learning about shipping containers and how they revolutionized the international trade. I became fascinated with mega container ships like the OOC of Hong Kong. I was also following the tiny house uh, trends um, and learned about people who built tiny homes out of shipping containers. Then it hit me one day that, you know, what if you made a floating city of tiny homes made from shipping containers on a major container ship. And I was just like, wow, that's be so cool. I mean, these container ships are incredibly expensive. I mean, they're like $160 million plus. But if you if you divide it into small enough pieces and get enough people on and, and to, to help crowdfund it with you, then it would be it could be affordable for everyone involved. <clears throat> and so that's how the whole idea kind of started. On um, May 20th, I created a Facebook group called Creating a Libertarian Seasteading Micronation. And a lot of the people who I've been talking to online about this, uh, we met there and it, it's been steadily growing since then. Um, and we've been discussing ideas and how to solve various problems. Um, one week later, on May 28th, we chose the name Freedom Haven as a name for our planned micronation. Um, not to be confused, Freedom Haven is the name of the country. New Liberty is the name of the structure we're looking to build. Okay, so we'll, we'll get into that. I, for, I love to... So I love the idea that you kind of independently came to the idea of of forming free homes on the water. I mean, it reminds me of how calculus was was thought up independently by Newton and Leibniz. Like that just says that this is an idea whose time has come. If if people are independently coming to these conclusions, uh, I just I love that so much. Yeah, and, and the fact that I was finding out that there was so much already in the seasteading community and, and all these other ideas out there, I was like, wow, I have people been thinking about this too. This is amazing. And I just got more and more excited about it, the more involved I got. That's awesome. Okay, so so walk us through a bit more of the process. So your first step was you created a Facebook group to discuss uh, a micro nation um, with with folks you'd already talked about with who are, who are these folks that you invited to your Facebook group at the beginning? Um, well, initially we started out with like, you know, 50 or, or so active people on the group. Uh, and then uh, over over time, it just kind of grew and people heard more about it. And we were also talking to other groups and there's a whole seasteading community and they kind of found each other over time. And we currently have about 290 people on there and there's all kinds of different backgrounds. We have all kinds of different um, experiences, uh, engineering, people who live on, on um, floating structures today, oil tankers, um, floating homes. Um, all kinds of really great experience that's collectively in the group. I myself don't have an engineering degree, but I uh, studied computer science. And at, since we've started this, I've been doing my best to learn everything about all the different subjects um, that are involved with this, um, from uh, um, uh, international law, um, uh, metallurgy, um, uh, ship design, you know, all these things. And, and we've been slowly growing. The design itself has been slowly growing over time. Um, as we've been learning <laughs> our foibles and uh, our mistakes in our initial designs and just been making a lot of progress. Very cool. Um, and so you mentioned that the name Freedom Haven came out of discussions with the group. So tell us about that discussion and, and why you landed on Freedom Haven as the name. 
we were thinking of, I mean, we, 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 we contemplated different names. Um, we, a lot of, uh, Ayn Rand Atlas Shrug fans, we thought about calling it, um, Galtz Gulch, but we realized that a lot of people wouldn't understand what that reference meant. Um, we wanted something to actually describe what it is that we were creating. And, you know, we want a place where we had freedom or liberty and it wanted to be a haven where people could be, uh, could flee to, you know, refugees could come to and people could find the freedom they're looking for. Um, and also like, um, I think Ronald Reagan talked about, uh, this is our last uh, haven for those who seek freedom, America that is, or, or was. Um, and we just kind of came up with the word uh, freedom haven since then. And we had uh, some polls online to talk about what do you think about this idea, what do you think about that idea, and we discussed a couple of things. And um, there were a couple of people who were concerned about calling it Freedom Haven because it might give people the wrong impression about what we're building. Um, uh, because they, they thought that you might think it was a, an anarchist society. Uh, but hopefully we've we've corrected that understanding that even though we do want a lot of freedom and it will be like people, people still call us anarchy, but we're not really anarchy because we actually have laws. And we do have a hierarchy in the sense that if you try to invade someone's home and they stop you with their shotgun, they are government to you. And there is a hierarchy there. So it's kind of more of a technicality, if that makes sense. I think that uh, there's the risk of being misunderstood no matter what name you choose. Like that's just that just seems to be part of of human society uh, is that you will be misunderstood. So I like the name Haven, though. It's very soothing and it 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 feels uh, it feels like well, a safe place, a safe place to be free. So I think it, it sounds like a great name. Um, you mentioned the laws. So um, you have a constitution uh, already online. So you could tell us a bit about that. Like why, why draft a constitution at this point in the development of Freedom Haven? People who, who seek the same high level of freedom that we do often think that laws aren't needed for anything and they call themselves anarchists. Um, some of them do. Well, laws, well, we don't really need laws in any, any um, in most happy past scenarios. What do you do if someone kills someone, kids, kid, yeah, kidnaps somebody, or steals from someone else? Um, what if there's a disagreement on how to deal with it? Um, whether it was justified or whether it even happened? Without a previously agreed legal structure for handling these unusual situations, which will hopefully be the exception, uh, confrontation would escalate in, until the strongest party ends up winning. And we wanted to avoid a might makes right kind of result. Um, so agreeing on the minimal laws needed to handle those conflicts ahead of time seemed like a wiser course of action. Um, that way, the rights and freedoms of all people can be reserved together, regardless of your wealth or poverty or race or gender or religion. We don't want the person who's the strongest or the group that's strongest and has the strongest pull to be pulling the strings. We want everyone to be equal and have equal rights throughout it, which means we all need to kind of agree ahead of time how to handle those exceptions. Believe it or not, people actually disagree on what even constitutes murder or what even constitutes theft or, you know, any of those things. So it's, it's good to have us be on the same basis before we start. So what are some of the discussions that you've had around the Constitution and, and what are some of the, you know, were there disagreements that you all had to come to a resolution about? Um, basically about when force is justified. Um, we, uh, one example is, uh, I mean, some people believe that you can, you should only use by, by force. We mean threatening someone else's life, freedom, or property. Um, basically when you please come to a rescue to do all three. Um, uh, when, when someone's using force, when, when is force justified in what situations? And there was some disagreements Some people wanted to have more control and some people wanted to have a little less control. And what we ended up doing is that, well, if we had the constitution have the least amount of control possible, then your own structured or whatever you live on, you could choose to have more control if you want to. And those who agree to live by that could live on your structure and you can, you're all on the same page about what it is. So we, we, we try to keep it as free as possible. And then, you know, individual states, so to speak, could always take away from that freedom um, and those who agree to live there. So tell us about the goal to have Freedom Haven eventually qualify as a state under the Montevideo, Montevideo Convention. How do you say that? I think Montevideo. <laughs> I keep thinking I'm talking about an MTV video or something like that, but it's actually called Montevideo, I think. Being recognized as a state isn't a requirement for the project to work. Uh, it comes with a lot of benefits. Um, since ship that, ships that don't fly a recognized flag on the open ocean are classified as pirate vessels and seized, uh, will be flying a flag of convenience 
in the meantime, but that means it will be subject to the nation of the flag that we fly. Uh, we'll still have most of our freedoms that we seek, but we'll find our rights squashed from time to time if th that nation that we're registered under decides to board, search, or otherwise harass us, or if they give other nations permission to do so. Uh, one of the most common methods that I've, I've heard of is that U.S. will go out on waters and want to board a ship for whatever reason, and that ship is registered under or flagged under whatever nation, and they'll contact that nation and say, okay, you will now give us authority to board this vessel. And that nation says, okay, we'll give you authority to do that. And then they do that. And then, you know, they board the vessel. So that kind of uh, allows them to be a bully of the seas. Uh, but once we're legally established as a nation, according to the Montevideo Connection, and then recognized by the UN's International Maritime Organization, IMO, we will have increased freedoms. Uh, we can then not only fly our, under our own flag, but we will also have 12 nautical miles around our land-based territory for people to live in free from the rules of other nations, while giving us a location on the map that we can be part of a global marketplace. Sure. So the, so the requirements are you have to have a permanent population, a defined territory, a government, and a capacity to enter into relations with other states. And so in order to get there, I, I mean, the first thing you need is, is, a, is a physical platform, right? So tell us about uh, designing a platform? Well, um, there's some disagreement about whether a floating platform would qualify, uh, but we think that, I mean, obviously uh, those in power around the world don't want another nation to appear, so there'd be, um, you know, I don't want to get conspiracies or anything, but, you know, there'd be people who would, who would try to find a technicality as to why that wouldn't qualify as a state. So we're looking at, um, even though China has been a terrible example in the South China Seas um, uh, recently, um, they have shown us how you can take uh, sea mounts or other uh, low, high seabed locations and build them into artificial islands. And there are, you know, many dozens of sea mounts throughout throughout the world that we could do that with, where we could actually literally build up the sea mount until it, it, it peaks above the, the the ocean and is and it's literally an island. And if we have a permanent population on there, even if it's just you know a dozen or so people, that would qualify. And then the majority of the population would live in the waters around it, but that would in all directions um, that we could live in peace without being harassed, at least legally. <laughs> do you know uh, what it takes to be considered a permanent population? And how long do people have to live there for them to be considered permanent? I don't know. Um, that's, that's a good question. I imagine, you know, that, that they'll, they'll try to push it and try to make it sound like it needs to be longer and longer, but um, we'll have houses or homes or apartment buildings or whatever it require whatever is needed at that location to make it a to qualify for a permanent permanent population and if needed we'll expand the island out a little bit but so you also talk about on the website of selling living space and you list at three hundred sixteen dollars per square foot as a five year lease so how do you expect uh, that to to work out um to for selling living space. Uh, t walk, talk us through that that reasoning. Um, is to provide a, a expensive, uh, expensive structure that'd be like a mega container ship. Although we're going to be building our own structure, it won't be like a mega container ship because we'll have bigger pathways. So we'll have, uh, for example, mega container ships don't actually have floors that connect to every container. They don't have uh, septic and plumbing and, and utilities. And this will have all that, which means we'll probably, instead of having like 20,000 containers on a mega container ship, we would probably only have like 4,000 containers because it'd be spaced differently and stuff and it'd be more livable. Um, but we're not, we're not, uh, um, the idea is, is to break out the like maybe $200 million container ship uh, or the structure into um, spaces about 4,000, what we call a TEU, 20 foot equivalent units, basically what a, a short shipping container is, or, or think of it like a, uh, um, a travel trailer. Um, that, that's kind of what this kind of space we're, look, we're talking about. And together, those leases would pay for the whole structure. Now, it's important to note that we're not we're not selling the space permanently because I don't, there are some people who do that, but I don't believe that it's honest to sell a space on a floating structure because every floating structure eventually succumbs to the elements. That that's, it, It's inevitable. Um, so if you if you promise them that forever, this space will be yours, you're kind of lying because at some point your structure will no longer be there. 
it will either be at the bottom of the ocean or it will be somewhere else and you're not really selling that space. So instead what we're doing is we're gonna lease that space for five years. And during that five years, we will maintain the structure, we maintain the vessels, maintain peace and order, you know, make sure that people don't invade, um, things like that. But we will not promise beyond that because we don't know beyond that. We don't know, this is something kind of new. We've never done this before. So it's be kind of foolish to promise forever. Uh, so we're going to promise for five years. Sure. And so how did you land on the $316 per square foot number? A uh, 20 foot equivalent unit is uh, 20 feet by five feet. And if you have a $200 million structure divided into 4,000 um, uh, uh, shipping containers, then each foot in that shipping container is about uh, $315.66. Um, is the total price, and and also um, the we're we're not just paying for uh, the two hundred million dollars structure. That's phase four. We're going to, there's there's going to be four phases in this project. We're going to create a structure that's one five five hundred scale first, and that'd be done. We we'll just build that ourselves, and then we're going to build one that's one about one one hundred scale, but actually one eighty seven scale, which is the H O uh, scale that you use for uh, trains. Um, it's the most commonly used scaled out scale out there for for small things, um, and that would be about uh, twenty thousand um, dollars. In which case, everyone who's looking for a TE, uh, a TEU lease would be putting five dollars in towards that model, and that's the one that would be taken to FMRIL in twenty twenty one. And then the next one would be a one tenth scale model, and that's something we could actually um, put into a, a sheltered bay or harbor and learn from that and test that out. And maybe if we're feeling, feeling um, uh, dangerous, push that out into the open sea and see how well it does, even though it's one-tenth scale. So that means the storms are acting as if they were 10 times the, the, the waves that you would normally have in that structure. So it'd be a good test for that. And piece by piece, we would test it at each scale up from there. So in the end, people would be putting $5 in towards it, $500 and then $50,000 so that the resulting TEU would cost 50505 and that's our estimate at this point. And that would allow us to do the research and development at each stage until the final stage that we'd have out on the open sea. All right. And so you're planning to have a version at Ephemeral 2021. For, for folks who don't know, Ephemeral is, um, it's been called the Burning Man for Seasteaders. And uh, it's they, it takes place in California where folks bring their boats and build floating platforms and, and meet and talk and and hang out and it's a place to showcase different kinds of designs for floating platforms. So uh, that would probably be July, 2021. That's um, that's not too far away. That's pretty cool. Yeah, we're definitely looking forward to it. Tell us a bit more. So, at, so right now you're working on designing your structure. And so what are the challenges that you're working through with the design now? And then when do you expect to have that first physical model uh, ready? Well, we, we hope to have that physical model uh, before now, but we keep, um, we're we're a bunch of imperfect people working on, an, on a design and we're all learning our ignorance and learning the, what we're missing uh, technology-wise. If you want a good laugh, go back and look at the first design that came out with two years ago and that thing would not have float, floated. It was embarrassing. Um, but we've made a lot of progress since then. In fact, um, the last model that we actually had posted on our website, uh, we found out that it would work, but it would be too expensive. And it'd be pretty heavy. We wouldn't have enough weight on it to house as many people and as many shipping containers as we would like. So we revamped, revamped that. And we have a new design we're working on right now, but we haven't released the, the designs yet. And by the way, all the designs we have are all, as we said, open design. They're available for everyone for free. You can take it and run with it. You can expand it. You can build your own. We're not claiming copyrights or patents on any of this. This is all open. Everyone's working together to build something that the world can share. Um, but, uh, you know, trying to make sure that it's strong enough that it would, it would survive the, the, the worst storms out on sea. Um, the world record for, um, for a um, rogue wave is, I believe, 150 feet or 50 meters. Of course, that's in the North Sea, which is probably some of the worst waves in, in the ocean. There are other places where the, the ocean is incredibly calm and it'd be much better and we prefer to be in those locations, but we're trying to design it to be as robust as possible because you never know what's going to happen. And we want to make sure that this thing can stand long-term. Um, we, we initially wanted to build the whole thing out of concrete, 
uh, reinforced concrete so that there is no steel anywhere, uh, so it would not rust at all. Um, but that structure proved to be not only too expensive, but also too heavy. Um, so we're now working on, uh, the structure we're working on right now is one where the outside is encased in concrete, but the inside is a steel structure similar to uh, the mega container ships, except that the shipping containers and the floors and stuff and laid out differently and there's utilities and septic systems and all that stuff. Um, but just just going through, we, 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 we can, with the 3D uh, CAD models that we use, we can figure out the actual volume of the different substances. We can figure out the weight. We can figure out the strengths and do calculations from there to figure out you know, how it would actually handle. Um, although the, the wave test that we do once you actually build a small model, uh, which we'll be doing in our local YMCA uh, swimming pool, we'll make a, a wave tank out of that, uh, would, would be helpful as well. Although we've done other tests in the Mississippi River so far uh, that have taught us a little bit about how these things would behave in waves. That's very cool. I was going to ask you um, how you're testing the the materials that you're using. So is there is there a test in the software that you're using for the design so you can run virtual tests and then you take it out on to the river or to a pool? How does that work? We just have, um, I'm using FreeCAD and that just that just creates the models and we can create the volumes and, and test them from there. Uh, we, we uh, it's, it's currently being done manually. Uh, we know the load capacity of, of different uh, types of steel rebar or uh, basalt fiber. There are a lot of uh, people who have done intensive studies on how these different materials work. And we look up those studies and find out what the, the numbers are and how we would, how our model would behave. Um, Eventually, we do want to to bring those to some of those virtual um, tests um, and, and see what those how those render out as well. Um, but yeah, we also have the we're going to have um, with the the wave the wave tank. We're going to just take a normal large swimming pool and have people actually creating the two different kinds of waves. We're going to have one where it's all coming in one direction, or we're going to have one where there's waves coming from all different random directions. It's going to be more random. And those are more likely to produce rogue waves that we're seeing when different the energies of two different waves happen to come together, coalesce, and produce a wave that's two to three times as big as the ones around it, or even a, the opposite, a hole that's two or three times as deep as the normal trough of a wave, and see if it will overturn the structure, if it will cause any damage to the structure. Although I have to admit, welding at one five hundredth scale will prove particularly complicated. <laughs> I don't know exactly how we're going to do that yet, but... We'll try to make it as true as we can to that at that scale. Very cool. I hope you get some video of people in the pool, like making waves to test your your model. That would that would be really great to share. Um, so I, I also want to know what what do you think your ideal location for the final Freedom Haven would be? Like, are you looking at different parts of the world, and do you have sort of a a sense in mind of what kind of what part of the world you want to be in? have a map on our website, it's freedomhaven.org, where um, we've looked at different uh, seamount areas. Uh, although, you know, up front, we don't really need to have a seamount. We don't need to have a, a, a be, be um, qualify as a state in order for this to work. Um, we can just be floating anywhere in, in, in the ocean. The South Atlantic is particularly attractive because there are like almost no storms down there. Uh, from what I can tell, there were two registered storms, like two in the history. Um, the waters are calmer. Um, the Davis um, Davis Bank and Avima Seamount are options. There's there's an island owned by Brazil that um, they pretty much don't do anything with. They they keep that. Um, um, can't remember. There's just two islands in that location that have almost the exact same name, but they're completely different. But Brazil owns an island out there that they pretty much it's like 300 miles away from their coast, and they don't use the island for anything other than just to have a tiny little Navy base there with a dozen or so people. And if they were open to selling that to us, that would be a, that would be the best option. Um, but, you know, there are a couple different options available, but South Atlantic would be nice. Where can people find you and what kinds of skills are you looking for to help uh, with this current stage of designing Freedom Haven? Um, our website is freedomhaven.org, freedomhaven.org, and our main public Facebook group, it's a long one, but it's called Creating a Libertarian Seasteading Micronation. And you can also find me on Facebook at Anthony Charles Olson. 
Um, our biggest concern is that we don't know what we don't know. Um, what I'd love is for people to look at our design, look at the constitution, look at uh, our plans and find issues, uh, um, punch holes through it, you know, find, find, find places that we're missing stuff because that's, we've only come as far as we have today because people have been able to find the issues of what we had before and we've been able to correct them. So we, we love that. We love it when people come and find problems with what we're doing, um, design, um, uh, we're looking for things, uh, let's see, we're looking for uh, more information on uh, concrete construction, ship design, welding, um, oceanography, international law, um, anything that will help uh, this this uh, project be successful. Great. Thank you so much for being on the Seasteading Today podcast. Thank you for having me. The Seasteading Today podcast is produced by John Bush. Your host is Carly Jackson. Send feedback and questions to podcast at seasteading.org. To support the podcast and the Seasteading mission, go to seasteading.org slash donate. If you'd like to learn more, read the book, Seasteading, How Floating Nations Will Restore the Environment, Enrich the Poor, Cure the Sick, and Liberate Humanity from Politicians. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast feed and we'll save you a spot on a seastead.